Welcome to the Writers Guild Awards. I am your host, Roy Wood Jr. How are you doing tonight? I know you're a little tipsy. I know you're trying to, you know, cut some deals with your friends at the table. But eat your food and pay attention for a second. I work on a little show called The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Well, if you clapping so damn much, why didn't you nominate our writers? Anyway, I'm happy to be here. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, welcome to tonight's proceedings. I myself am not a member of the Guild, so it's important that you all know that I take this honor, that I don't take this honor lightly. To be a non-writer and to be in a room with people that create all of this stuff, this is amazing, you know? But let's be real. A lot of y'all are seeing me for the very first time. You have no clue who the fuck I am. All you need to know about me is that I'm what the Guild could afford. <laughs> Actually, I got hired as part of a package deal with the caterer and the DJ, so we have the same agent. Don't you just love packaging? <laughs> of course you do. As we all know right now, the Guild is renegotiating its contract with agents for the first time in 40 years. 40? Years. Even North Korea had a sit down before the guild. <laughs> Listen, right, there's a great book that I want to recommend to you. It's called The Art of the Deal. <laughs> Brilliant author, an amazing author. And I want you to negotiate with the agents the same way our government has negotiated recently with the Democrats. I want you to stand your ground on the funding you need. If you don't get the funding you need, then you shut down all work, then return to work and agree to a deal that gets you less money than you would have gotten had you not stopped working in the first place. Yeah. See, I'm exactly what this show needs, an outsider who's never done the job before, bringing in the big ideas. Also, I'm thankful to the Guild for hiring a black person because they knew by hiring me there'd be no blackface scandal. We gathered here tonight to celebrate the best in film and in television, or as Netflix calls it, new media. <laughs> Netflix has shaken this industry to its core. The most innovative tech companies always have. Napster, MySpace, Pornhub, Pets.com. <laughs> Netflix has changed the way we consume our favorite shows. The binge model gives writers an opportunity to tell richer and more meaningful stories, and they get to use the word fuck a lot without being bleeped <laughs> for eight to 10 weeks. And after that, be contractually banned from telling stories anywhere else for the remainder of the year. <laughs> At the end of the day, Netflix connects storytellers with who knows how many people. Seriously, who knows? Netflix won't tell us the ratings. <laughs> Netflix has also, also, this is very important to note, Netflix has also been an innovator in the way that they cancel their shows. <laughs> There's been some reports, some reports, that writers from Netflix shows found out about their show's cancellations on Twitter, or, or while they were still in the actual damn writer's room. All of the writers got let go at one time. Netflix has pioneered binge viewing and binge firing. <laughs> and we all know, everyone in this room knows, that that is no way to treat writers. People put their heart and soul into writing these programs, and they deserve decency. Yes, they're writers, but they're also human beings. <laughs> and everyone knows, everyone in this room knows the proper way to cancel a show. There's a proper way to cancel a show. You air the first 13 episodes, then you decline the back nine pickup 
and you leave the writers on pins and needles for the next five months, praying that their mid-season replacement show doesn't do as well. Then in April, you leave them in limbo for another month while you test all the pilots and focus groups. Then, at the last minute in May, you formally shit-can the program that you could have canceled in December, but instead, you waited until after all the new shows are fully staffed, thus leaving the writers you just fired no safe place to land. That's how you cancel a show. There's a right way to do stuff. You don't give them immediate freedom from a job, you string them along. Why are we talking about streamers? Amazon took it one step further. They didn't just cancel shows, they canceled Long Island City. How you cancel a whole city? Damn, Amazon. (laughs) But the streaming sites have been integral to the growth of the industry. Let's be real about it. All jokes aside, this year, 40% of our best series nominees are from Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu. 40%. 40% from digital. Take that, all the people in this room who a decade ago bitched, you don't need to go on strike for digital. (laughs) Yeah, there they are. But let's be fair, in all fairness, the streamers, they embrace diversity. Shonda Rhimes, as we all know, left ABC Disney for a lucrative contract with Netflix. She basically left the Bloods to go make twice as much money with the Crips. I'm sorry, triple that money, pardon me. But all that aside, let's talk about some of tonight's nominees. Let's talk about some of the nominees, shall we? Uh, If Bill Street Could Talk has been nominated, It's a good film. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I made the decision to see Bill Street Can Talk. I knew I had to see it because it was two black people hugging on the poster. That's all I need to know. Anytime you see black people hugging on the poster, you know they're going to be all right. (laughs) Loving basketball. (laughs) Just right. (laughs) Love Jones. If a black person on the poster by themselves, that means they going through some shit. 12 Years of Slaves, <laughs> Moonlight, John Q, Selma, and Into the Spideyverse. <laughs> you seen that Spideyverse poster? The boy jumped off a building, didn't even tie his Nikes. That's an emergency. Uh, I'm excited about this nominee tonight. A Quiet Place has been nominated. A Quiet Place. If you haven't seen A Quiet Place, this is a film about a man who finally decides to be quiet and listen. (laughs) The film did very well. I knew it was gonna be a hit. I knew the premise of Quiet Place was gonna be a hit, because let's be real, who's better at being quiet than white people? (laughs) All this racism and sexism sexism in Hollywood, y'all ain't said shit. But not y'all, y'all one of the good ones, of course. I'm not talking about you. (laughs) Now, they are doing a sequel to A Quiet Place, which I'm very excited about. Quiet Place has been greenlit for a sequel, and I'm dope, I think that's dope, that's amazing. But if you really want to challenge, if you really want to do a sequel that's challenging, cast Kevin Hart and Tiffany Haddish (laughs) and see how long they can be quiet in the film. (laughs) The Quiet Place sequel will be up for best short next year. Y'all, I know both of them. It's okay. You can laugh at that one. It's okay. Uh, Speaking of A Quiet Place, Mr. John Krasinski is here. Y'all please give John a round of applause. It's over there somewhere. There he is. The writer, director, and star of the film. He's also the star of the new Amazon series, Jack Ryan, where he is ripped. Have you seen the poster for Jack Ryan? Because you drank all the protein shakes. He's just bleh. And he's done something that's very rare in Hollywood. John has been hilarious in the office. He scared us in the quiet place, and now he's sexy on Amazon. This is a rare trifecta. I don't know if y'all notice or not how hard it is to make someone laugh, then make them scared, then make them horny. (laughs) I'm just being real. Not a lot of actors can do that. To be scary, funny, and sexy, let's just call that a Krasinski. The Krasinski makes an EGOT look like a participation trophy. Can't nobody do that. Chris Platt, he's closed, he's closed, but not yet, man. 
Not yet. Tonight's nominated shows and films, they are very important. That's why we're here to celebrate them tonight. They help us to escape the horrors of the world. And then there's documentaries. <laughs> documentaries are very important pieces of work. That goes without saying. They're important pieces of work that often peel back the layers of the human condition. And we all know when it comes to documentaries, there are just two kinds of people. There's only two kinds of people when it comes to documentaries. There's those of us that have not yet seen the documentary. <laughs> and there's those of you who will not shut the fuck up about the documentary. Oh my gosh, you haven't seen it yet? You gotta see it, man. It's the most good. You know the problem with documentaries? This, this is the problem with documentaries is that it's like the problem with documentaries is, is in how the word of mouth travels. They're different from traditional films and TV. Documentaries are the only programming that you talk about in a whisper. It's the only time. The more powerful the doc, the lower the whisper. That's when you know it's gonna be a deep ass documentary when somebody whispers to you, like, oh my God, I just saw the documentaries. It's about child soldiers trapped inside of Russian voting machines. It's a riveting tale. It's on the app. If you want more people to watch documentaries, stop whispering when you talk about them. Use a normal tone of voice. Case in point, there's two documentaries about the fire Fest, and everybody's seen both of them. You know why you've seen both? Because nobody whispered when they talked about the damn fire Fest. Top of their lungs. Oh my God, bro, you gotta see the fire fest. It's, oh my God, a dude almost gave a blowjob for water. It was crazy. <laughs> and immediately you was like, I gotta put that in my queue. <laughs> Nobody talked about the fire fest in a whisper. You know how creepy that would be? Well, it's, it's a riveting tale about a gentleman who nearly filleted another gentleman <laughs> to save will to do white children. It's on the app. You gotta, it's on the app. <laughs> Documentaries don't have big promotional budgets. It's all word of mouth. So your people are very important. So just don't yell. Don't whisper. Yeah, fuck that joke. <laughs> <laughs> the white wine is good. So as I bring this to a close, so we can go ahead and get started with honoring all of the people that made time in their day to be here, I would love to applaud you all for answering the challenge of inclusion. It was announced yesterday that Aquafina with Comedy Central will have a writer's room that's all women. That's huge. Very huge. And we can all agree that no system is perfect, but we have to acknowledge that strides have been made. A prism of the trans community and their stories is represented beautifully on the show Pose. Very beautiful. Writers, you've also shown us that Asians aren't just rich. They can also be crazy rich. You sit up late at night with your pen, well, I guess technically with your laptop, and you pen beautiful tales that address issues of women's suffrage, police brutality, and most importantly, writers, you finally wrote a script where Mahershala Ali doesn't die. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the green book, just because he didn't die. I, I know it's a movie about the first racist Uber driver, but still, thank you. <laughs> thank you for not killing the man. And to be fair, Mahershala's character in the green book is based on a real person, so you didn't have that much wiggle room. Stop killing this man. Every other fucking movie, y'all, kill Mahershala. Luke Cage, dead. Benjamin Button, dead. Place Beyond the Pines, double dead. He had on a do-rag in Moonlight. I thought he was gonna live in that one. Dead. Didn't even make it to act two. I'm scared to watch True Detective. I don't know what y'all gonna do to him. But nonetheless, the writers are the red blood cells of any production. Your words nourish the rest of the production. You nourish the actor's performance. So it's time we celebrate the year that was in all things film, television, documentaries, podcasts, and even new media. I'm Roy Wood Jr. Let's get this show on the road. <laughs> <laughs>